Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Matthew Scott. I'm president of Carnegie Science. I'm delighted you all came out tonight to join us for this. I was just told by our lecturer that it was the embryology department where he worked to introduce by saying, you know, this is Doug, and he'll tell you about his work, and leave it at that. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go into a little more detail than that, a little bit of background uh, about his topic and about him. We're all familiar with uh, Gregor Mendel. You know Greg, right? The 19th century monk, often called the father of modern genetics. We all know he used the common garden pea to learn how traits are transmitted from one generation to the next. He was very lucky in this choice, in fact, because it had certain advantages as a genetic organism that he could not have known in advance. We might not know that when Mendel began his studies, he first chose to use mice. He turned to peas when his bishop expressed dismay at the prospect of so much animal sex in the monastery. <laughs> Purebred peas with distinctive traits were particularly amenable for his work, and had he stuck with the mouse, he might never have made history. The history, of course, was lost for a while and then rediscovered much later. Darwin was deprived of the chance to know about this and some other very important things he might have delighted in. So the pea plant was a model organism, so-called, just a sort of suitable tool for discovering what turned out to be fundamental principles. Model organisms in general are used with the hope that you're going to find something very general, and that's turned out to be much more true than was often suspected. We have a common heritage of genes and proteins, and that heritage is richer and deeper than anyone dreamed at the outset. They usually can, the model organisms chosen are usually chosen because they grow quickly, reproduce quickly, easily manipulated. In some cases, they get mutations very easily. And each one has its favored features. There are giant neurons in uh, squid axons. There are all sorts of properties that make a certain organism useful for a certain kind of science, a certain kind of discovery. And choosing a model organism is something many biologists go through early in their career. They become somewhat committed to a certain kind of obsession with a certain model organism, and then they will defend it to the death against, uh, with its virtues against what other people say better about their model organism. So there are hundreds of experimental organisms used, but there are a handful of true and tried, tried and true organisms, mouse, fly, certain worms, and so on. The National Institutes of Health regards about a dozen official model organisms as of primary importance. Mice, fruit flies, xenopus, frogs, nematode worms, zebrafish, and yeast are among them. And there are lots of protocols and methods, and often uh, decades or even a century or more of investment in building useful tools for that particular organism, including often many variant strains of those organisms. Now, tonight's speaker, Doug Koshland, is famous for beautiful, really spectacular work using yeast. Now, yeast is a single-celled fungus. It grows easily in the laboratory. It's most famous, of course, for things that we care deeply about, like beer and bread. It's also, though, a very important discovery organism. It has been used by hundreds of laboratories, not all with the skill that Doug has applied, but many um, very creative people have used it. And it's proved its worth in many ways, even though it's probably a billion years away from us in terms of an evolutionary distance, it turns out to use a lot of the same mechanisms in its cells that we use in our cells. Its cell and its nucleus indeed divide in a manner very similar to our own cells, and many of its genes have counterparts in the human genome, which is sort of astonishing. You are a lot more like a fungus than you probably realized. In the uh, early 90s, uh, yeast was deemed so important to modern biology that it was selected for a, a full-scale attack on characterizing its genome, its full DNA sequence. That was completed in 1996, the first eukaryotic organism, the first with a nucleus and it within its cells uh, to be so characterized. Now, Doug Koshland was instrumental in promoting it as a model for studying cell biology 
For over 30 years, he's used this tiny fungus to characterize fundamental mechanisms that maintain chromosome structure and integrity. Chromosomes, as you know, are remarkably compact structures. Each of the cells in your body has two meters of DNA coiled up in it. More remarkably, it can be copied, and then the copies can separate without uh, tangling being a problem. And most of us people, well, some of you have hair. Um, hair is hard to untangle. It's not nearly as compact as a yeast chromosome. So he's explored how to understand the process by which the chromosomes are condensed into compact forms from these long strands of DNA in an organized way and then selectively unraveled for the genes within them to become uh, active. And then have to go through all sorts of lining up and pairing and sorting because each daughter cell in the process of cell division has to inherit the right number of chromosomes with all the kinds represented, no duplicates, no missing parts. And that takes a whole complex machinery, which he studied. He was the first to identify proteins called cohesins, or really protein complexes, that regulate the separation of the duplicate during cell division. His work, as it turns out, has a lot of importance in medicine because these sorts of mechanisms that control cell division are important in cancer and other diseases. Now, more recently, he started to study a sort of peculiar and fascinating aspect of yeast, which is its ability to tolerate desiccation. I just went to visit our Carnegie giant telescopes in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and I was studying the same process of desiccation from a different angle, my own. Uh, now, yeast is much better at it than I was. Uh, it can survive the temporary loss of almost all of the water within the cell, so this shriveled thing can survive. This kills most other cell types, but yeast is very tough. It's an example of an organism that can survive extremes, and you've all heard of other examples of this, like the incredibly rich life in black smoker vents deep in the ocean, uh, organisms that live in the boiling pools in Yellowstone National Park. You can see the colors of the algae and bacteria. I mean, it's just amazing what life is capable of at the extremes, and this is what Doug's topic is today, how studying life at the extremes or employing life at the extremes has revealed things about more familiar life. And as you look at these things, it's better than science fiction. It's more amazing often than science fiction. There are barred godwits, birds that fly from Alaska to New Zealand nonstop the length of the Pacific in seven days without ever setting down. That to me is a miracle and it happens every year. Uh, and these things that you begin to understand about microorganisms and about large-scale organisms that just astonish you and say, well, how do they navigate and how do they find their way, even if they have the strength physiologically to do these things, how do they do it? And they share a lot of our genes, as I already alluded to, and a lot of our protein structures, so they are exaggerated forms in some way of what our parts are. But we exaggerate things, too. We've got the swollen frontal cortex that we're always bragging about, even though we're far inferior to many animals in other respects, uh, particularly some athletic ones or our ability to use sonar to navigate. We're not very good this way. But we all, each animal has its own special you know, properties and advantages, and that's the kind of thing uh, Doug will be talking about. So who is this guy? He's an alumnus of the Carnegie Institution, which I'm very proud of. He's worked with the institution for many years. He's now at some Western university. It's called um, Berkeley. Berkeley. Uh, he's a professor of molecular and cellular biology there. He got his bachelor's degree from Haverford and his PhD from MIT, as did I, and we overlapped there and, and admired his work for many, many years. He did his postdoctoral work at the University of Washington, a great center for genetics, and then at University of California at San Francisco, another great place. And then he joined Carnegie as a staff member in our embryology department in Baltimore in 1987. It was a crucial uh, member of that department for many years, including playing a big role in planning the beautiful new building we have there. 
At the same time, he was an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins. From 1997 until 2012, he was recognized by Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigatorship, and he stayed at the department for more than 20 years, moving to Berkeley in 2010. I'm very happy, of course, that he's uh, still our close friend and comes back pretty often. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Academy of Microbiology and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's won a Lucy Scholar Award, the Beckman Young Investigator Award, the Helen Hay Whitney Fellowship, many, many really important honors. He works really hard. He served on a lot of different editorial boards. He's a board member of the Life Sciences Research Foundation, which was created by Don Brown as a way of supporting young scientists. And he's a former board member, Doug is a former board member of the American Society for Cell Biology. He's got a great sense of humor, and, and people love working with him. Uh, he does innovative research. We miss having him in our midst, but tonight we have him back if just for this evening, so join me in welcoming Doug tonight. Okay, well, it, it's a great honor to be here, uh, part because I think many of you know that Carnegie from this venue, but I hope you appreciate it's one of the great scientific institutions in the world. Its contributions to biology, astronomy, uh, geophysics, eco desert ecology. Uh, the other reason is uh, this audience, which I uh, know is a uh, very learned and uh, amazing audience. It's very used to hearing really awe-inspiring talks about astronomy. Uh, and so I'm hoping that I can make biology at least as, almost as awe-inspiring as astronomy. So the topic is, is, is today is up here. There we go. And um, because of I was a little bit intimidated by you as an audience, I thought it was very important uh, to start with some goals. Because as the famous scientist Yogi Berra said, um, if you don't know where you're going, you're, you end up someplace else. <laughs> so I, wanna, I have some explicit goals for tonight. The explicit goals really are what makes extraordinary special in biology, what piqued my interest in, in the extraordinary, what is the history of extraordinary in, in the biological, and an example of it, sort of one in process work on desiccation tolerance, and finally, what do I think the future of using extraordinary in, in biology is. I also have some implicit goals. My implicit goal really is what is it like to be a scientist? And I want to hope to convene you that where do we get our ideas from, uh, what's the fun of discovery, the wrong turns we take, the successes, and the fact that it's really hard. So to begin to sort of understand what is special about being uh, 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 extraordinary, I thought I would start with a little word association. So if you see this picture, your first response is, I think the word would come to mind is smart. If you see this picture, your first, <laughs> your first association is not so smart. So the question is, really, how do, can ordinary scientists make important contributions? I think at least one way we can do that is through extraordinary biology. So what I want to do is to first tell you why I think this is so helpful to people like us. And fundamentally, it comes down to a very simple principle in science, which is really what we're trying to do is to increase signal to noise. So signal is what we want to study, but the problem is there's usually a lot of noise that prevents you from observing, studying it. And what extremes do is they allow you to study signal to noise. So just an example here, we have some trait. It could be the color of car, red color of cars more red in this direction. And we have the number of cars in that direction. And you get some distribution of cars if you observe them all. And you have out here, basically, the rare guys that are very colored, very extreme. And the question is, by studying these weird guys out here, 
about the population inside. So let me give you an example, which I think really sort of puts it home. So supposing you were asked to do the following. You want to study teenage boys who will later play in the NBA. And you say, well, that's impossible because there's about 20 million teenage boys, and only about 20 in any given year are going to make it into the NBA. So if I were to try to study them, I would have to study, take films of 20 million people, and that's cost prohibitive. I couldn't possibly ever do that. But if you say, okay, well, what about if I just take people between the, who are six foot five to six foot eight? Turns out the numbers get better. The noise goes down. Instead of having to study 20 million, it's one in 10,000. That still seems pretty prohibitive and very hard. However, if you take people over seven feet tall, I was astounded to find this out, about one in five Americans who are over 17 tall will play in the, in, the, in the NBA. So the single to noise is way down now. Now you could actually just go out and find the 25 kids who are seven feet tall and study them, and you're pretty guaranteed that those studies will be worthwhile because five of them will end up in the NBA. So that's a classic example of, I think, and the really take-home lesson I want you to get tonight, just keep thinking about this, is that's what we're talking about. We've used biological extremes to increase the signal to noise to find, make profound observations about biology. So the next question is really, how did I get interested in the extraordinary? Okay, where did that come from? So you might imagine that I like playing with weird toys when I was a kid, okay? It turns out that that's not what it was. What it was was I liked playing with weird friends. <laughs> so this is my weird friend over here, Mark Roth. He's doing a TED Talk. I recommend highly that you see this if you're interested. And I'll tell you a little bit about his research and how it got me excited. So Mark was interested in roundworms. And he was particularly started studying their response to oxygen. And what he found was that when they were present in low oxygen, for a period of time, and then return to normal air, they were damaged, very similar to what would happen to you, for example, if you had a mild stroke. However, he found something rather astonishing, which was if you, you put them in no oxygen, and then return to normal air, they were perfectly behind normally. So you might ask, what's normal behavior for a worm? And just for example here, this is on Friday night, they go out and they put on their green dresses and they dance around. Okay. So this is actually GFP-colored worms, and what you can see is you can watch them move, and you can characterize their behavior and the ability to move, how well they move, how well they eat, and they were perfectly normal. So now let's contrast that and think about people. What happens to people when they're exposed to low oxygen? Well, they can be exposed to low oxygen by having a stroke or, for example, being frozen. People that are exposed to low oxygen for a long time when they have a stroke, unfortunately, like President Harding, end up dead, okay? The people that are frozen are dead, but remarkably, they come back to life. Significant time, if they're warmed properly, they will come back to life. So the question is, what is the difference between these people and the ones up here? Why is it they come back to life? And Mark fought to his results with a worm, and he said, hmm, what he thought was happening was the worm. The problem with low oxygen is, you try and soldier away, and you keep trying to function, and then you get all kinds of if you imagine your gas is kind of low, and the car starts sputtering, and you push the gas pedal harder, and what ends up is the car jerks all around, you hit the tree, and then boom, it's bad news, right? But if there's no gas in the car, you get in the car, you can't go anywhere, everything is fine, right? So what he said is that when you were frozen, your body responded and essentially made your body as if it had no oxygen, as opposed to when you're having a stroke and it's trying to keep working. And so he figured there must be some kind of regulator of oxygen consumption in the body. And what could that be? And he thought it might be a gas, hydrogen sulfide, which seems odd because hydrogen sulfide is the gas which is one of the most deadly gases that exists. But it turns out that hydrogen sulfide uh, is produced by almost all eukaryotes, including mammals. So he did an experiment. And this is, you're going to see a mouse. And the mouse is, we're going to measure its oxygen consumption by actually, every time you burn oxygen, you make CO2. And what you're going to see in this movie is that the uh, mouse is going fine. It's consuming oxygen. It's moving like crazy. And in about 
A few seconds, what you can see is hydrogen sulfide is going to go into the cage. It's going to flash in there. There it goes. And now what you're going to see is the mouse is going to slow down. Oxygen consumption is going to go way down, and eventually it's going to slow down and sort of just be still. And then they're nice to this mouse, so they take the hydrogen sulfide away. And then what you're going to see is, boom, it's away. And then eventually what happens is the oxygen consumption will go back up, and the mouse will start moving like crazy. Now, you say, well, this is trivial. This is they just like giving him an anesthesia. Right? Just, just, what's the big deal here? Well, the big deal is actually, if you look at these mice under the conditions where here, where they have the hydrogen sulfide, it's not like the anesthesia. When you're in anesthesia, your heart keeps beating. You all watch the show ER or whatever it is. And they're in the operating room, and you hear the beep, 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 beep. That's the good news. These guys have a heartbeat of goes from 200 for a normal mouse to 6. More importantly, when you're also in the ER and you're in anesthesia, your body temperature is still 98.6. The body temperature of these guys, since there's no oxygen being consumed, they can't keep themselves warm, and they become reptiles. Their body temperature is whatever the ambient room temperature is. Okay? Basically, what he's done here is he's converted the mouse to, to be able to hibernate like a bear, just by putting it in the presence of hydrogen sulfide. So where we come in this particular story was that you started studying worms and how they, didn't, they were in an extreme condition of anoxia. And from there, you discover that H2S is likely a regulator of um, oxygen consumption in essentially all eukaryotes, including mammals. And it turns out there are huge medical implications for this work, which are in clinical trials right now in terms of presenting, preventing oxygen damage due to heart attacks and um, actually strokes and eventually preserving organs. So my response to this was, wow, I got to get me some of this, OK? Um, because I thought this was really original. I hadn't heard this. I hadn't heard of somebody saying, let's study something really extreme. And that's guaranteed to give you a niche, because nobody's going to do something wacky like that, right? Who's going to study something really extreme? And that would give me a really cool way to do some science. So then I started to read and I thought, where is it? How really original is this approach to science? So I started reading up on stuff. And that's where I got in trouble. OK, so you all know that ner nerves are bundles of neurons. Um, and neurons work by passing electricity from where the neuron stimulated one end to the other end to stimulate your brain or whatever else you're going to do. So that's great. The question is, how do we know that? How do we know or how do we know about how the electricity is passage along the length of an axon? And it turns out, it's this guy here, squid. So why was the squid a good uh, source? Is it because it's reminiscent of your Uncle George? Uh, I don't think so. At least my Uncle George is a little bit better looking than that. Um, the idea was um, that it, it's the first example of where extraordinary, and if you can have many parameters that could be extraordinary or extreme. In this case, it's the, the axon, neuron. So in the squid, you can see it here. Over here is the mammalian axon. For those of you in the back of the room, if you can't see this, don't worry. You know, that's a good sign. For those of you in the front room, who can, you think you can see it, you drank too much Kool-Aid before you came here. Because <laughs> at this magnification, you can't see the axon of a mammalian. So why was this so valuable? Well, it, it allowed the, the scientists in the 60s, um, that's just the size differences there, to cut the neuron and inject a pipette. Uh, and you can see that there. And then you essentially lasso it all together to make it a closed thing. And now what you can do is you can flow whatever solution you want into this pipette, into the neuron, and you can change the salt solutions inside the inside of the, of the neuron, the axon there. And what they, in doing that, they found out that what, how the nerve works, the neuron works, is there are channels along here that exchange the salt sodium for calcium, and it's just propagated of a wave of changing, exchanging calcium and sodium uh, along the length of this thing, and that generates an electrical current. So that's an example where extraordinary size makes a difference. Now we turn to another example. 
here is the nucleus. It's got chromosomes inside of it. The chromosomes are critical because they are sort of the blueprints of the cell. They have instructions to build the machinery that directs cell processes. They're so important, of course, every time you duplicate, you've got to duplicate the, the cells. You also have to duplicate the chromosomes because now you're going to have uh, a, each cell needs to have these set of instructions in order to be able to build, to, to, to build its building blocks. Well, if we look at a chromosome more carefully, it's shown here. It's, it's a thread-like thing, and it, it's composed of two components, DNA and proteins. And the reason for that is you can think of a chromosome as a cassette tape. The DNA is the magnetic tape inside, but the magnetic tape doesn't do you much good if you don't have plastic housing. And similarly, because the magnetic tape is fragile. So similarly, the DNA is fragile. It needs proteins around it. And in particular, it needs some protein structures at the end of the chromosome one is the DNA out there at the end. It's kind of like there are proteins that will chew on it, kind of like if you're chewing on a piece of licorice from the end, the string licorice, you just kind of chew it from one end all the way down to the other. There are proteins that will do that to DNA. So you need to put something at the end that will block those guys from chewing. It also turns out that uh, chromosomes, if they have an, the DNA is exposed, it just sticks to other chromosomes and causes all kinds of havoc. So you want to cap it so it doesn't interact with anything. So then the question is, <clears throat> You want to study these things. You want to understand how they do this at the molecular level. What are they doing? So you say, OK, I'm going to isolate them, and then I can study them. Well, there's a problem. The problem is that most cells have few chromosomes, somewhere to be 3 in 100. So you multiply by 2. You don't get a lot of chromosomes out. You don't get a lot of telomeres out to study. And the analogy here for you to think about is somebody, you know, you're a Martian, and they send you down to Earth, and they say, study sand. You want to see what sand so you have two grains of sand. You have two grains of sand. You take the first one, you drop it in some water, not much happens. You take the second grain of sand, you put some in the water with food dye, and not much happens. Now you're done. No more experiments. But if somebody gives you the whole sandbox from the neighbor, right, now you're in, you can play like crazy. And maybe eventually you heat it up, and you discover that, sure enough, you can make glass. Or maybe you heat it up, and you, discover you, you mix it with some water, and you make mortar. So that's the lots of something. So how did we solve this problem? Well, it turns out we, Liz Greider and Carol Blackburn and others, discovered this organism called tetrahymena. This is a little bug that swims in the water of your ponds, and it does something very strange. Instead of having one nucleus with the chromosomes, like all most organisms, it has two, two nuclei. And the second nucleus, it takes the chromosomes and it chops them up into little pieces and then amplifies them and makes lots of copies. And the end product of that is every one of those little pieces that it's made has to have the two caps on it. So now, instead of having 20 caps, you have 10,000 little chromosomes and 20,000 caps. And now you have enough of the caps, you can study them, and you can figure out what they do. So the end product of this was, in fact, we understood how the ends of chromosomes work. But if you read any of the medical press of the last year, it has this structure, this cap, has incredible importance, in, in, in certainly in how cells divide and its potential for cancer therapies. It's also important possibly for aging, and it has implications for stem cells. So again, we started with a weird organism that did something very strange and found something out very profound about biology. Now, I want to tell you two other examples very quickly, which is how do we know how a gene works, or what is the structure of a gene, or how does it work? Well, it turns out that a large amount of information came for the first eukaryotic gene from a gene from Xenopus, and again, it was the same thing as I just told you about with the telomeres. It was studyable because of the fact it wasn't copied in, present in one or two copies like most of the genes in your, organ, in your body, but it was present in 10,000 copies. And that allowed you to do, manipulate that gene in a way that was not possible, certainly biochemically. Turns out that, how do we know? That's sort of, we could get the structure of the gene. How do we know how the gene is actually read? Well, it turns out that newts, these really weird, have these humongous chromosomes where you could actually just visually see how the DNA is being read, sort of like a ticker tape machine, uh, to generate the RNA, which is going to eventually lead to the protein structure. So those are two more examples of uh, huge chromosomes and amplification of genes, not from 2 to 10 or 20, but to 10,000 that allowed you to do something. The work was done by Don Brown and Joe Gall. So who are Don Brown and Joe Gall? They are very famous scientists. Half both of them uh, have done amazing work. Both have won the Lasker Award, one of the highest honors in the United States. 
Um, and they also turned out to be my colleagues for 20 years. So now you might begin to think something, which is, okay, so what I told you is that Mark, Mark Roth had was not a creative, really a bold, a new idea. It was a well-tried idea throughout biology, and it had been seminal to discoveries that resulted from sort of looking at the extremes. The question is, why didn't I know about it? Particularly since I had colleagues in my own department who were doing it. I'm really looking bad here, right? So you could say, well, Doug, you told us you weren't so smart, right? That's a possibility. But I'd like to think there were some other reasons besides not being so smart. One of them is I think it was really ingrained in early biologists, of course, they were sort of pushed that way because they had, technically they were very limited. So you just, if you had an, an organism that had large eggs, you worked on it because that made it life easier. You know, if you're working on the squid and you happen to see this big tube, you say, oh, that big tube, I can do something with that. Lo and behold, it's a neuron, I can do something with it. So it had stopped sort of, you know, it had been used a long time ago and people were just exploiting these things when I was a, a young scientist. The second thing that happened is a technical revolution. So what happened is that we have now amazing tools in biology you to take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. So as I told you before, well, you couldn't study mammalian neurons because they were too tiny. Well, it turns out now we've got tools we can actually begin to study mammalian neurons that where we couldn't do it with the, before we had to have the squid. So I guess you can say at this point, well, okay, maybe the time of working on extreme organisms is done. You know, now we can do things with computers, we can do things with amazing microscopes, we can, why do we need to do this anymore? And so what I'm going to hope to tell you now is I think we still got, to, I still got to get me some of this extremism, okay? Because I think there's a real room for some of the big issues that we have to tackle in biology, and I think there's lots of interest. We can't even conceive of some of the problems, even though we have the technology to, to look at them. So that brings me to, well, I got to work on something. If I'm interested in extremes or extraordinary, what is it? Well, water, everybody knows, critical life, all the Mars missions you're going to hear about, maybe I think next week, everybody's looking to see if there's water. Is there life? And that's because water is about 80% of any organism and its cells is, is water. So there are these amazing organisms that Matt mentioned that survive with almost no water. Um, they're shown here. They have this amazing thing is once the water goes away, they can return to life. And in fact, they can survive without water for months, sometimes years, sometimes even uh, thought to be thousands of years without water, essentially almost no water. So I figure this is something profound. We can figure, if we can figure out how they do it, we'll learn something essential about life and about uh, how, how organisms and cells work. So the question is, okay, that's the a topic you want to try, do, you got to pick an organism to work on that is going to be useful. So it was pretty obvious humans was not such a good idea. Okay. So instead of that, we turn to this budding yeast. As, as Matt implied, in fact, I've been working for 20 years showing how ordinary budding yeast was, that in fact, it had chromosomes just like human chromosomes, and we could discover these proteins were involved in organizing them, and they turned out to be important in cancer, and now they're involved in stem cell regulation and all kinds of fun things, um, sort of pushing how ordinary it was, how like it was humans. But of course, you all know, when you go to the grocery store, you get a packet of yeast. It's been sitting there for months. It goes into your home, and you forget about it, and you make your bread once every five years, or your pie, or whatever, and that stuff, you put in some water and some sugar, and it, and it comes to life. It's, it's not spores. These are just dried down cells that have the ability to come back to life. So yeast, we know how to manipulate. Nobody cares if you kill them. You can kill them by the millions, and nobody cares about it. It's really good. So it's very simple. You take a culture of yeast cells. Let's say 5 million. They're in a, in a growing in a liquid media with some food for them, and you move as much liquid as you can, you just let them air dry, desiccate for a couple of days. Then you rehydrate them and you say, well, how many guys are viable here? Just count the number of viable cells. At the same time, you do the control, which is you take the, the same culture and you never desiccate it, and you then measure how many viable are there. And then all you do is we can do this, we're not astronomers, but we can do this kind of math. We just divide the two, and um, that gives you the percent survival. So this tells you how well you survive if you haven't been desiccated versus how well you survive if you haven't been desiccated. 
Okay. So now we get an interesting result. So if you take dividing yeast, ones are growing because there's lots of food around. This is a plot here of how many to survive, and it's a log scale plot. So it's just important that each bar here runs a tenfold difference. And what you can see is that if they're dividing, one in a million cells survive. But if they're nutrient starved, now it's about 20%. So there's a huge difference, it's like almost a 100,000 millionfold difference here. And that begs two questions. Why? What is killing these guys? And why are these guys alive? What's not, why, why doesn't whatever it, that's killing it here, why doesn't it kill these guys? So we think the idea is, well, there's some stress that's induced by desiccation that kills the dividing cells, maybe multiple stress. And that these nutrient star cells have what we call stress effectors, some magical molecules, proteins, whatever we think, that somehow mitigate those stresses so they don't cause lethal damage to the cell. A little bit like Mark Roth's hydrogen sulfide. Okay, so what do people think? It's everything in cells. It's a biochemical uh, cofactor in most reactions. It's a, it's a solution which you move, move stuff around. It, uh, you know, it helps uh, diffusion. It does all kinds of things. So these are all stresses they think that when you remove water, you're going to have problems. The proteins are going to aggregate together. The membranes are going to break. The DNA is going to break. The cells are going to become acidic. They're going to become They're going to have problems with their salinity or salt, and they're going to have pressure issues. So that's all the possible things. And people have known that there are stress effectors that have been identified, proteins that combat the aggregation, things that affect uh, control osmolarity, membrane integrity, oxidative stress, and small molecules, trahalose and proline. So we're now stuck with the problem, OK, these are all the potential stresses that could be killing them. These are all the potential molecules that could be. Are any of these important for fighting desiccation? They all seem like candidates, but were any important? So the way we get at this is being a geneticist, so I just want to sort of give you the strategy here. It's very simple. So the way to think about this is supposing you're a Martian and you've been told by your captain of the ship to go down and you know there are cars and you know that they have this noise coming out of them, something they think you hear the humans call radios. And you're, you're instructed to figure out what parts of the radio actually are important for, uh, part of the car actually are important for radio function. So how do you go about doing that? Well, what you're given are the blueprints for all the parts of the car. That's what you're given. So what you can do is you can say, OK, I'm going to take the, the blueprints for 20,000, and I'm going to give the factory 20,000 minus 1, 19,000 blueprints. So the car will be missing just one and on one and only part. Okay? And then I'm going to tell the factory to build that car, and then I'm going to observe the radio function. And if there's no music, that part must be important for the radio, for music, right? Okay? If uh, and so I do this over and over again, just repeating this over and over again. Go through all 20,000. I find when I delete the instructions how to make 50 parts, the radio doesn't work. I say those 50 parts must have something to do with the radio function. So I decided to do the same thing, just with yeast. This was Dean Callahan, my first graduate student, who was brave enough to jump in this project with me. And the idea is very similar. We take the DNA sequence of all the yeast genes. This is, the, again, the instructions for the parts. They had all been sequenced because of the project at Matineau, so we knew the blueprints for each of the genes. And then the yeast community had taken, essentially made that, that collection dead. They had taken a yeast strain and deleted, removed one gene, and then they did it over again for another strain, so that in these wells here, each well contains a yeast strain that's missing a gene. And we just do that for all 6,000 genes of yeast, and we just ask which of these strains of yeast each one which is missing a different gene is now sensitive to desiccation when we nutrient starve them. Okay? And the same logic. If all of a sudden the desiccation tolerance goes away for a particular gene that's removed, that means that, that gene has to do something with desiccation. That's the simple logic. So, how many genes did we find when we did this experiment? Zilch, zero, zip, nada, nilch. And just in case that number doesn't mean something to you, I thought I'd put in some context. The number of bipartisan bills that will be passed between now and 2061. <laughs> That's actually a typo. I think it was supposed to be 2016. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe it's more realistic. I don't know. OK. So, so this is where I'm telling the science is hard. We're a little depressed at this point, right? This is not so good. Okay, one of the things that didn't come out 
which we thought was the biosynthetic gene for this sugar, trahalose. So trahalose is two glucose molecules that are stuck together. It turns out the chemistry of putting two glucose molecules is not so trivial. Glucose is the main sugar of your body. It's the one that is used to generate burn, to generate energy. It's the thing that's actually used to make a lot of the building blocks inside your cell. It's, it's the key thing of which insulin controls. Okay. So it turns out it's not so trivial to make it. So you take glucose and you derivatize it into two things. And now what you do is you make, there's a gene called TPS1. It makes a protein called TPS1. You can see we're very creative in yeast. Um, that protein takes these two sugars, puts them together, and makes this compound called trail-6-phosphate. And there's a second gene, TPS2, that makes the protein TPS2. So we're, 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 we may be boring, but we're, I mean, we, but we're consistent in yeast, that's for sure. Um, and this protein converts this one to trahalose. So the simple idea was that if you knock out this gene, this instruction is not present inside the cell, you can't make, this protein's not made, there's no way to convert this there, and so you're not going to make any trahalose. Alternatively, you can knock out this protein in the cell, and similarly, you can't make this intermediate into trahalose. So both of these genes should prevent trahalose from being made, and they do. There's no effect on desiccation tolerance. So why were we surprised? Well, we were surprised because, and certainly the conclusion is, okay, you don't need trahalose. It was there. It's, you can knock it out, big deal. Well, the reason we're surprised is because it's found in huge quantities in almost every androhybiosis that's around there. Every cell that's desiccation tolerant has tons of trahalose. And so we just thought, well, that's a smoking gun. That means it's got to be important. Why weren't we so surprised? Well, it turns out people had noticed the fact that there was a lot of trahalose present in cells. And in fact, plants have, uh, in desiccation tolerant cells, but even desiccation sensitive plants have trahalose in them. And People tried to engineer plants so that they would make more trahalose uh, with the hope that they'd become drought or desiccation tolerant. And the answer is they got a really weak effect, and importantly, they made them sick. So everybody gave up on it at this point. It's like, okay, this is not, there's something else, but move on. And indeed, um, come to the conclusion that trahalose is not the holy grail, and sometimes that correlations are, um, are can and I, just to give you an example that, that, that we confront this in science all the time, you may know that uh, drinking lots of coffee is heavily correlated with cancer. And so why aren't all of you running out of the room now and getting all upset? Well, many years ago they discovered that the reason it's a heavy correlation is because people that drink lots of coffee smoke lots of cigarettes. And so it had nothing to do with the coffee, it's just that you're just detecting a habit thing. So we didn't know why trahalos was but it could be that analogy. So we forgot about trahalos until very talented postdoc in the lab came, Ugo Tapia. And Ugo said, Doug, you've been making a mistake. The problem is you're not thinking like a yeast. So I, I've been often accused of thinking like a yeast, but uh, <laughs> certainly relative to your astronomers, I probably... Anyway, turns out that yeast are often, in, at least in California, there's no rain from May to October. And so maybe we didn't do the experiment right. So let's think about it. What we had done before was we had desiccated them and then rehydrated them after two days. Why don't we do the experiment of letting them sit for a long time before we give them the water back? Then might we see an effect for trohalos and, and, and what happened? First of all, what happens to yeast if you don't surrender this for, for a long time? So this is the experiment we see. So here, what you can see on this side is our desiccation tolerance. Log plot again. And what you can see is, this is what we were looking at before, two days, wild type cells survive fine. But what you see is after 30 days, it comes down a little bit. And after six months, a lot of them have died. Then we measure the trahalose concentration in those cells. And little and behold, we see that after uh, 30 days, the trahalose concentration is dropping. And he drops even further after 180. So now we're back to having a correlation. Trahalose does seem to be affecting, at least correlating, with the ability to survive desiccation. The less you have, the less good it is. So this thing makes a prediction. Is it just another correlation? I just told you correlations are dangerous. How can you do anything about it? Well, we can say, OK, well, there's a prediction from this. One is that if we uh, reduce this, they say, well, supposing we get rid of all the trails in the cell, so there's no trahalos at this point, would we drive the viability down further? That would be if trahalos was really important, you get rid of it, they, can't, they shouldn't be able to survive long term at all. Well, the alternative is if you could make them not degrade their trahalos and keep it around for a while, maybe then they would actually survive better. So those are two simple experiments we want to do. Well, the first one I've already told you you know how to do, and that is 
we can get rid of all the trails in the cell by knocking out these biosynthetic enzymes with our deletion. What you see is we call exactly what we, what we predicted. So at 30 days, where uh, now the wild type cells normally survive fine to 30 days of desiccation, if they don't have trahalos, they lose a 100, 200, almost a thousand fold more sensitive to desiccation. So trahalos, having it there, did seem to make a difference. What about the other experiment? So the other experiment is, if we, the prediction is, of course, if we could keep trahalos levels high, they should be actually be sort of immortal and survive a really long time, even when they're desiccated for a long time. So the question is, how can we prevent trahalos degradation? So you have to think like a Martian or a yeast geneticist, go back, it's the same simple paradigm. It turns out that yeast, trahalos is broken down in yeast by two genes which encode two enzymes that actually will break the trailers back down into two glucoses. So we thought, well, if we knock out those two genes, we won't have the enzymes that can break trahalos down, we'll have more trahalos. That was a simple idea. So what happens? Lo and behold, we see, just as we predicted would happen, here's wild type again, you see a big tree crease in viability after 180 days because they're at least that's what we assumed. And if we get rid of these enzymes and keep the trahalos levels as high as they can be, now we see that they're totally viable after 180 days. So it works. So this was really exciting because the correlations all work. Now we're really beginning to see trahalos is doing something. But it also told us something interesting, which I think will be relevant to your talk next coming. People didn't want to believe this at first because you think about what I just told you. What I told you is the difference here in wild type versus this guy is that there are enzymes present in the desiccated cells that are chewing on the trahalos, gobbling it up over time. And if we get rid of those enzymes, it works. Well, nobody believed that enzymes would be active in 2% water. They thought it would be impossible. You couldn't have metabolic activity. So I think that's something important for the people who are looking for life on other planets to think about, right? The question is how flexible life is and how well it can work under conditions where we didn't think it could, even in the sense when so you, the people on Mars don't have to look for 80% water. They can look for 5% and some, at least some metabolic activity will happen. So let me recap. This is trahalos is necessary for survival and long-term desiccation. Desiccated cells are not totally dormant, which is what I just told you. They're actually having some enzymatic activity. And what I won't have time to tell you about today is we actually sort of began to figure out what trahalos is doing. It's protecting against at least protein aggregation. And this actually helped us figure out, you might say, well, why is it not required for short-term desiccation? It turns out that cells have a second way of at least preventing protein aggregation. They have machines that will sort of pull aggregates apart. And those machines, we think, remain active for a couple of days. Um, and so even though you don't have trahalos, <coughs> you, can, you can solve the protein aggregation problem. But it's important that the machines require cells run out of energy, and so that goes away. Trahalos keeps working, because it's a little molecule that doesn't require anything. Like, so the analogy I think I think about is, you know, if you you're going to prepare some emergency, I would suggest you have a bicycle in your garage as well as your car. The car is very complicated. You can use gasoline. It can work great. But in fact, you know, it's really nice to have something where you can pedal and is very simple and will work forever, right, as long as you're alive, anyway. Okay. So we were getting pretty entranced with trahalos. This is a pretty cool thing. And the next question we wanted to ask is, is it, we've shown you it's necessary. You need it if you die. The question is, is it sufficient? And so this is a question geneticists ask all the time. And again, I'll give you an example. You're trying to figure out what are the fluids needed for a car to work. You know gasoline is required for the car. You know that. So you say, I'm, gonna, I'm a Martian. I'm going to do a very simple experiment. I'm going to take a car, the engine that came just out of the, the shop, and I'm just going to give it gasoline and see if the car works. Is the gasoline all you need? And of course, you'll start the car up and you'll have disaster, right? Because it's not enough. You need the oil and you need the other fluids. So we want to know, OK, we know there are all these stresses that cells suffer when they're desiccated. Is trahalos just dealing with one of those stresses, and some of these other molecules deal with the other stresses? Or is trahalos some kind of magic molecule that can really make things tolerant? It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, it's a, you know, a magic reagent that deals with everything. So I remind you that everything I've told you about before is the desiccation tolerant cells are the ones that are nutrient starved. And they have all these goodies in them. The desiccation, the biting yeast, I'm sorry, the biting yeast are desiccation sensitive and they have none of the goodies. So that allowed us to do an experiment. We said, well, what if we add only trahalos back to these guys? Now we can ask the question, are they desiccation tolerant? And that will ask the question, is it 
uh, isn't sufficient because the C cells don't have anything but this. So how do you do that? Well, yeast have on them a transporter on the outside. And, uh, um, well, sorry, yeast have, can have, we have a collaboration with uh, David Botstein and Pat Gibney's laboratory, we uh, got yeast that have a protein on the cell surface. And what this protein does is it allows trahalose, which is normally impermeable to the cell, to be added as a media. And with this protein, it's like a magic, it's a gate that lets the trahalose inside the cell. So you can accumulate trahalose inside these dividing cells. And, and now you can ask the question, is the trahalose necessary to promote desiccation or sufficient to promote desiccation tolerance? So here what you can see are the original cells I told you about. These are normal dividing cells. Uh, and as I showed you before, they're very sensitive to desiccation. But now, if we add this receptor protein, which allows them to transport the trahalose cross and trahalose, we see robust desiccation tolerance. So it appears that trahalose is necessary and sufficient to allow cells to become desiccation tolerant. And just to point out, as you, you want to make some predictions here, if, uh, if you just add trahalose to the cells without the transporter, it just sits in the media and so they remain, they remain sensitive. If you add the transporter, uh, it doesn't do anything. It needs the trahalose with it. So that was a really great experiment. Now, this was a wow experiment to me. I would have never predicted this. I, waters require lots of things, a lot of stresses. I would have never thought one little sugar could bring them to life. Um, and I'm still kind of contemplating it, to be honest with you. Um, so, but it allowed us to do an experiment that was very fun. Because it turns out that yeast and all androhybiotes, they don't just have trohalos, they have a bucket of trohalos. They have uh, actually like 20% of their mass is this sugar. And so the question is, why did they build up so much sugar? Is it really necessary or are they just like panicking and you know, it's kind of like you, these days you build a bridge and you put 27 tons of concrete for the little thing that needs like a two foot pillar. So the good news of the experiment I just told you about is we can add trohalos to the media and we can essentially control how much they take up inside them. And we can add a little bit, so they only have a little bit inside, or we can add a lot, and they have a lot inside. And so we can ask, how much trahalis do you need to keep them? And what we found was shown here, which is that, um, that a very small change in trahalis concentration made a huge difference in how viable they were, and that, in fact, the need to keep them alive in response to desiccation is a lot. So they aren't fooling around. They really do need a lot of trahalis. So why is that interesting? And I, I'm you know, speculative is people have been working, the, the biochemists and biophysicists have been working with trailers awful trying to, because they knew about the plant stuff and everything, and all the, the, the androhybiotes. They didn't really know it was important, but they thought if it is important, we should study the biological properties trahalis might have. And one of the things that trahalis does when you start removing water and it gets hyper-concentrated is vitrifies. So it's called vitrification. Vitrification is just the process of forming a glass. So when <clears throat> you remove it, it turns into a glass. So why is that could be valuable? So imagine here's a cell loaded up with all kinds of proteins and trahalos. It, the trahalos turns into a glass. When it's a glass, it sort of freezes everything in place, prevents all the proteins from getting together and sticking to each other. So it keeps everybody in their proper place, sort of like. Um, but if you desiccate and you don't have any trohalose, what happens is you just, the proteins all come together and they aggregate because there's nothing to keep them apart. There's no glass. There's a, literally, we're talking about glass here. And so they're going to die. So that's what we're thinking about right now. We're thinking that's the mechanism of what may trohalose may be doing to keep cells alive. Okay. So what's next? Well, one thing <laughs> is I've told you we've sort of figured out that des desiccation tolerance is extraordinary. Um, and so we actually want to revisit the question, can we make plants desiccation or dehydration tolerant now that we know a lot more about how trihalos work? And the experiments, I think, failed in part because they never got trihalos up to high enough concentrations I just told you was critical. The other thing is, for example, blood storage is the reason you have to keep giving blood mostly is actually, I didn't realize this, but most of are bad. It's not that they don't have it has a shelf life. And can we use this kind of trick of, of, of desiccating blood cells, for example, to keep them alive? So, uh, what I want to point to you is that the science is hard, and I, uh, the, 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 uh, I've only told you the first half of my title. So what I've shown you is desiccation 
tolerance, and I've told you the extraordinary part in what Trujillo's does, but have we learned anything about the ordinary yet? And I just want to point out that the examples I gave you, it took 20 to 30 years to go from the tetrahyma telomeres to showing that they're like human telomeres and how important they are. Right? So uh, the answer is we don't know. Could be that I'm you know, leading you down the garden path here. But I actually think there's some interesting possibilities, and let's, let me just give you an example. So one of the questions is, what is trahalos? Who is trahalos actually protecting? I told you it prevents protein aggregation. Is it protecting all proteins or a subset of proteins? Or, and I call this my Achilles heel theory, because I actually think that it doesn't protect all protein. It just protects a few critical ones. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> if we had some banditos come in here right now, bad guys, and they started taking things from you all. They take your jackets. You get a little upset. You know, they take some of the things. They take your underwear. You're more upset, right? But what couldn't you survive without? Your cell phones, right? If they took your cell phones, you get really bad. This would be terrible, right? So there are some things you can do without and other things you can't do without, right? So I think cells have the same thing. The question is, what is signaling the cell to make trahalos? <clears throat> and Dean actually did find some very interesting things out in his work. And, and one of them is that the mitochondria, functional mitochondria, which is the energy driving machine of a cell, is important <clears throat> for trahalos uh, to be made. And that's very interesting to me. Just This is kind of soft science here. I don't know, but I happened to look up one day and found out that kidney cells, when they dehydrate, they start changing mitochondria like crazy. So is this connection between yeast and desiccated stones and some primordial use of the mitochondria related to how your kidney cells function? A colleague of mine at Berkeley, Andy Dillon, studies stress and uses worms. And making observation that organs, one organ that is stressed will signal another organ that it's been stressed, and the, and the other organ will now sort of be prepare itself for stress. Um, and he has again found there's a connection with the mitochondria. So we think studying desiccation and studying how the mitochondria controls it may lead us to understanding that thing, that the idea that the mitochondria is some kind of central stress, uh, central stress uh, sensor. Okay. So... Other extraordinaries are still being studied. I just want to point out there's some very cool guys out there that are actually being studied right now besides yeast. There's this little organism called tardigrades. I think if you've never heard about it, it's one of the most amazing organisms. It certainly is the most amazing organism, I think, on the face of the earth. Little guys, you can see he's going to eventually turn over and look very cute and sort of crawl around. Um, they may put yeast to They're desiccation tolerant. They're also a free 328 degrees Fahrenheit. They can be heat tolerant to 240 degrees Fahrenheit, <coughs> and uh, they can slide. So they've actually been sent up in the vacuum of space uh, and come back and been alive and produce fertile young babies. Another example is the naked mole rat. So it's very pretty. <laughs> um, naked mole rat <coughs> lives 30 years, and far, as far as now, there's been never cancer detected in these organisms. Sometimes you don't get cancer in organisms that live two years. It's not a big deal. Something lives 30 years and doesn't have cancer, that's a pretty big deal. So are these examples of where we can find some really interesting new biology? So and I want to end with the following simple point. With, is there extraordinary biology yet to be discovered? And I want to think about this, and at least I thought about it recently. Let's think about the exploration of the moon. We spent $29 billion explore it to find new things about space. It's a lot of money, like $170 billion. I remember I was just projecting to go to Mars and all this stuff. And I would like to propose that we maybe spend $5 billion scouring the Earth for tardigrades and squids and all kinds of new organisms to look for extremes that might be interesting to pursue to figure out fundamental things about biology. There's a lot of examples. I think you may have just, just to make a point, if you read the New York Times article <clears throat> where they took sequenced DNA from the New York subway, only 50% only of the DNA they could identify to being belonging to some microbial species they knew about. So even in New York City, half of the microbial world, we have no idea what it is. And microbes have been the major generator, I think, of changes in biomedicine uh, probably than anything else um, with TAC polymerase to allow gene, gene sequencing. The most recent uh, CRISPR you may know about are spectacular. Here's an example, at least the one thing I might look for. So I've been, every decade is the decade of neurobiology. They're going to figure it out. And I believe there has to be some major paradigm changing, at least in, in 
because it's so complex. You get this thing called emerging principle. Masses come together, and something we can figure out very much how you stimulate my fingers. The nerve goes up here, goes to my brain, and then it does eventually it causes me to be hot. So then the nerves come down here and make my take off my jacket. Take off my jacket. So, but what happens in the brain? Once the nerve gets into the brain, once the nerve, that's the big, the big black box. Right? It's really hard to figure that out. And I don't know, maybe there's going to be some computers that are going to be atomic computers that can help us out. But I suggest why don't we try the extremes. So here's the model. We have humans that have 10 to the 14 synapses. We have fly that have 10 to the 7th. We have worms that have 7,000. Even 7,000, I think, is too much. Why don't we find an organism that's got 20? Then we could study. Then we could say, OK, the only thing it does is it eats and it turns things it does. It makes those decisions. Is there such an organism out there? I don't know, but maybe. Why don't we look for it? You know, I think it's as good as sending something to Mars. Personally, I have a little bias here. You know, I'm a bias. So I think there's a lot of really interesting biology to be learned. Uh, and I think we can, technically we can do stuff, but you can't deny evolution. Evolution gives you remarkable tools to study biological problems. And uh, I think it needs to be sort of re-emphasized in biology. So with that, I'll thank you for listening. I want to thank the people that uh, did help me with the work. Hugo Tapia, Aaron Welsh, and Dean Callahan were fantastic. I got funding. Uh, actually, you should have Carnegie up here at the top. I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> this work was started in Carnegie. And I remember talking to a colleague of mine, Randy Sheckman at Berkeley, who actually won that this was before that. And I told him about this work on desiccation. He goes, that's great, Doug, but who would fund that? Um, and so I'm proud to say that Carnegie uh, supported me, never questioned that I should work on this. Uh, and now I'm getting funding from the Mathers Foundation. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. So we have a couple of here set up for questions. Please limit your questions to 12 minutes uh, each. <laughs> OK, can I go first? Or no. you want to go first? OK, I'll go first. So you had this, all your trehalose, trehalose, you have proline, but you didn't mention anything about it. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, no. <laughs> So uh, yeah, proline is also prevalent in quite so often quite high concentrations in desiccation tolerant cells. Uh, uh, we haven't found a way to manipulate it yet. So, so do you know it's proline or it's proline rich proline? Um, it is actually, well, no, I don't know the answer to that. So I think it's some kind of you know mass spec or whatever. Yeah. So there are lots of things about desiccation to figure out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kind of a question, you know, from the left field, but mm -hmm. <coughs> um, if if life evolved uh, billions of years ago, mm -hmm. somewhat spontaneously, mm -hmm. it seems like it should still be possible for life forms, new life forms, to be forming on the Earth. Is mm -hmm. there any research or looking into that sort of thing? And that sort of leads into what you were uh, alluding to in your final slides. Yeah, uh, you know. I think it's a real, I, I, I certainly believe that evolution continues. Uh, we, we are seeing new life forms in viruses, uh, okay. things like SAR and SARS and stuff like that, that have become, that in terms of more complex organisms, I suspect they're happening, but, um, it, you know, I mean, the only way we know that something didn't exist was to have a, 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 an archaeological thing. So if you find something, uh, you do, you know, is it new or is it just because there's no paleontological record of that? I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. It's tough. I mean, some, I think the people who are much more uh, biologists than I am would say that there were changes in the earth, you know, uh, the environment and the stuff that promoted explosions in new forms of species. And we may be in a place, our current environment, well, before global warming, we may have been in a place where we were pretty safe, so it said he said, I suspect you know, global warming could maybe induce uh, new species. I guarantee you that you know, we may not live through global warming, but lots of biology is going to make it fine. They're, the, they're very adaptable. Right, thank you. I would like to know the long-term application of this test. Say, yeah? I would like to know the 
long-term application of this uh, research work. The long-term application search well, as I said, uh, we, we... I would like to know whether this can be used as an indicator to assess the health of the organisms, including human beings. Something relevant for human beings? Yes. Yes. Well, I, I, well my answer to that is several. Obviously, if, uh, if we can, uh, if global warming happens, and for example, California turns into a desert, which it appears to be doing at the moment, uh, if our plants all can be sprayed with trahalos and they can survive the, the more drought conditions they have and people get fed, that would be one approach to human health. Uh, would be very important. There's, I mean, that's a sort of practical example. As I said, also, if we can uh, store blood in trahalos solutions such that you can uh, bag of dried blood just the way you have dried food that you take to the thing and, you know, you get injured, you shoot it. There's another example. But I think the, the more profound examples are going to be sort of the basic biology that I talked about. So let me give you an example. And it's, you know, this is the same thing happened. So we studied yeast chromosomes, and people said yeast don't have chromosomes. They're not relevant to anything. And you start the plaque, and you just assume biology has these wonderful connections. And so we found this protein complex called cohesin. It's the major number one protein knocked out in cancer cells, which are undergo chromosome instability. It's big in stem cells. So, have a faith that uh, we're going to go there. And I think the big problem was how do cells know that when you have Alzheimer's, just to give you, I'm going to give you a wildly speculative thing and then I'll let somebody else go in. Alzheimer's is a problem of protein folding. And we have machinery that deals with protein aggregation. But we don't really understand how cells sense when proteins are not, when they're not folding properly and when they're going to aggregate. And there's a kind of general idea that there's some way of sensing protein, whether it's folded properly or not. And if you do the math, it's almost impossible. It can't possibly be that way. So I prefer to think there are canaries, proteins like iron complexes that are already on the edge of being soluble. And what happens to them is when things get messed up, they go insoluble. The cell says, OK, my worst case scenario is becoming problematic. I've got to turn on the machinery to help out, and there may be another protein. So I think that the desiccation actually might lead us to that protein, and that may help us with Alzheimer's. It's just a wild speculation. But you know, we don't know. This is the uh, I think it's very dangerous in biology. I want to make it very clear. The big, the most recent big breakthrough is CRISPR, which you may have heard about, which allows you to engineer cells to really study human biology in a way that's important. You know where that came from? A bacteria that makes yogurt. The Yoplait people were trying to understand why they were dying. And you would never predict that for human health. So we've got to explore the whole horizon. And what's one of the things that Carnegie has been so wonderful about. So. My question is, in the future, is it possible to develop a test to find out the level of this uh, protein so that we can find out the, we can use this oh. as an indicator of the uh, health of the organism? Yeah, so that's an interesting, we, we certainly have lots of tests for the, for, for the compound. Um, just to make clear, humans don't make trahalos. So we are different from everybody else. Um, and uh, so the direct application in that sense will be different, right? It may be indirect through the things I mentioned. I'll take a lot of them. Another yeah. question. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, what about uh, moss uh, desiccation tolerance? Bryophytes are another yes. great yes. model organism. They are. They are very nice. And that, that we're actually so we're collaborating with. We're starting to collaborate with the guy who works on the uh, tardigrades to see uh, because he actually also thinks they vitrify. Turns out they don't make trahalos, but they have some of the other things in there. And so we think this common principle of vitrification is a big deal. So the mosses are very interesting. And uh, we, the problem with them at the moment is, as I told you, the way we figure this all out is the trick we use of genetics, of having these ability to manipulate the genes, to change the blueprint, to change the cells in a predicted way to make. And that's not too easy to do with moss at the moment. Well, the best place to find tardigrades is in a patch of moss. Yeah, so. that's right. No, I, that, that, you think, are they eating it? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I don't know of anybody who's working on moss right now. So we, the, the, the guy, Bob Goldstein in North Carolina, is working on tardigrades, has just been able to do what we can do in yeast. He's just figured out ways to knock out the genes in tardigrades so he can ask the same kind of questions we've asked in yeast, which makes it a very parallel system. But, and I don't know about where they're going with moss at the moment. Yeah, it's, again, or, or So this is related to the previous question, but... Is there any thought why tardigrades have evolved a system to be able to tolerate, you know, vacuum in space? I assume they didn't anticipate to be <laughs> sent to, to space. Yeah, uh, so that's a good, I mean, right, so what's the evolutionary selection for these? So I have to tell you, there's examples of that. So uh, there's an organism called just the Dinococcus rhinodurans. It's a, it's a yeah, that's resistant to huge amounts of radiation, just huge amounts of radiation. And people have, they 
it's just remarkable. You know, you're going to put it next to like a, you know, something that humans would die many times over. And um, people say, well, but nowhere on Earth would that organism ever see that kind of radiation. So it's the same question Orna just asked. How, what selects for them? And they thought, well, what, so it's desiccation, that they, they would be desiccated at times. And desiccation might just fracture the chromosomes in a way the same way that radiation does. And what we've discovered is we don't see desiccation causing chromosomes. So it's not radiation sensitive. The so the tardigrades, they are thought to be one of the most ancient organisms. And so you can argue that uh, maybe they were back in the world when, you know, there were still volcanoes, a lot of volcanoes, and water was going, changing a lot. And uh, they're very, very, very ancient. And um, there's some, well, I think Bob Goldstein's about to release the sequence of the genome, and he's told me there's some really fun stuff in their genomes, which argues they're very different from everybody else. And maybe that's because they're so ancient. But I, yeah, I only, why they keep it to this day, they do, they live, they're all over the place. They're in, they're, every millimeter of water has them, they're in, they're, you can find them in a lot of places. Well, salt, they're, they're so, kind of like the alligator. Yes? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't get to the microphone, so maybe you um, what about seeds? They're seeds. all totally desiccated. Yes, yes. They've been around forever. Right. So Maxine's bringing up, uh, I left out of a major part of biology, which is seeds. And seeds that people don't know, seeds are actually cells. They're not just kind of some little thing. They actually have an embryo inside of them, and the embryo is just kind of stalling, waiting for the time when it gets to food and water. It has some capsule. So seeds have all the same things that yeast have in them and tardigrades. Seeds have lots of trohalos, most of them. Uh, they have these small peptides called L, which is another thing we're trying to study. These are little proteins, peptides that nobody knows what they do. There are 70 amino acid peptides, tons of them. Um, so uh, hopefully this would be relevant to understanding how seeds survive uh, in, in the same way. Yeah. So I forgot to, I think you were, I hope everybody heard the question. Yeah. Being a non-scientist, I've always been fascinated by how often in scientific research big breakthroughs took place inadvertently because of failures of an or mistakes. Sure. And I noticed one of your earliest slides you made reference but never expanded on it, on m your mistakes. So I was just wondering if in, you could give us a good example in your own research, some of, you know, any insights, big insights or breakthroughs you got through a failed experiment or a mistake. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I meant it a slightly different way. Um, there's a lot of serendipity in science, for sure, in terms of finding things out. What I meant to imply there was um, that, you know, I'll tell you, we miss, so when we originally did the experiments and we found the trohalos, and we could prevent its synthesis and cells could survive desiccation short term. Um, I gave the talk and a young Korean postdoc came up to me and he says, you have to go back to Korea and talk to my small city which was five million people, because there was this some kind of lotion play that had taken over the city and was convincing all these people to put a trohalo cream on their skin, uh, that it was a big health thing. And he was just mortified because he thought they were all being ripped off. Um, and I told him, well, you know, they probably won't listen to a scientist like me. So, but in fact, as I told you, we hadn't done the experiment right. We had sort of concluded trohalos wasn't important because we only looked at a very short period of time. I can look at longer. So now I'm kind of glad I didn't go to Korea and give the speech because I, I don't think that trohalos can get in so easily through your skin, but maybe I have to think about it. Maybe there's something to it. It's certainly been around for a while. Uh, and, you know, that's just an example that I meant about, you know, you make mistakes, you come to the wrong conclusion, but then sometimes something writes you back to come to the right one. Um, but there are certainly examples of... Uh, uh, I could give you lots of examples about mistakes we've made that have turned out to be valuable. Probably not in this context. Though. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, if there aren't any further questions, let's have thanks to Doug. <clears throat>